In this video, we are going to discuss some general tips and tricks for creating better ray trace renderings to share with your clients. We'll discuss how to play with settings to get a look that matches the scene, how to find good camera angles, using light creatively, filling in a scene, and we'll wrap up with discussing how to set your defaults so that you don't have to make adjustments for every camera view individually. This video is the last in a series on ray trace rendering, so if you haven't watched those, you may want to go back and watch the first six in the series first. I've mentioned this a few times in these videos, but it bears repeating. Rendering is not an exact science. It's an art form similar to photography. A lot of the same skills that go into creating a good photograph also apply when creating a good rendering. And just like in photography, lighting can be used in a number of different ways. In the two previous videos on lighting, I showed you the settings that I look at and some values that I start with, but those were all just preferences. The lighting settings will change based on the plan, the scene, and the look we're going for. For instance, here are a few different options for the exact same space, creating very different effects. Here I've kept the sunlight high and the daytime backdrop intensity high to create an early morning look inside the house. Here I've turned off the sunlight completely and turned off most of the lights in the great room area to draw your eye towards the back of the room. And here, I've done what I showed in the GPU lighting video to keep things bright and to balance the contrast be it between the inside and outside views. And remember, if you've reached a point where a scene just isn't working in a GPU or a real-time ray trace, you can always switch gears and try the CPU ray trace to see if it creates the lighting effect that you're going for. Sometimes lighting that doesn't work for one scene is appropriate for another. For instance, in this living room rendering, done with a CPU ray trace, here's an example of lighting that causes the space to be too washed out for my personal preference. I would want to lower the contrast, eliminate the bloom, and get rid of the softness. However, here's an image using these exact same settings where it works because of the design style. In this image, the softness and bloom create a warm glow, where here, the same effect is misused. My point here is that while it's helpful to have some go-to image settings to start with, these settings are meant to be played with depending on the scene, and it's important to think through what effect you're wanting to create. Next, think through your camera angle for the scene. One thing I do pretty regularly, especially when working in tight spaces like a bathroom or laundry room, is to turn my walls invisible. In my plan, you can see that for both of the saved cameras pointing towards the bathroom and towards the laundry room, they're placed outside of a wall. If I double click on the camera to open the view, you can see I'm looking straight at the wall. But if I click on the wall, down in my edit toolbar, you'll see the option to make it invisible. This does not delete the wall and I can turn it visible again at any time, but it allows me to expand out from rooms to see a wider shot. Since it is invisible, I can't select it in 3D to turn it visible again, so I'll need to go back to the plan view to then select it, and I can do so in the edit toolbar here. While wide shots like this can be helpful for seeing small spaces, often in our desire to fit as much of the room into one image as possible, we wind up losing important details or having too much floor or ceiling or grass or sky in an image. Here are a couple of examples of what I mean. Even though this shows a wider view of the room, it doesn't center on the main feature, the kitchen, and it actually makes it harder to see the elements that matter for this image. And here, we may be able to see the full home in this rendering, but so much of this image is dead space. At the very least, if we're going to zoom this far out from the home, it'll help to add in plants and other exterior objects to help flesh out the scene, and make a more interesting backdrop than just sky. This goes for interior images too. Adding furniture and accessories can sometimes help a scene to feel more lived in. It's essentially virtual staging, showing clients how the space could be used. So for instance, here's a scene that we looked at earlier without furniture. This is not a bad image and can help your client focus on the architectural features, but adding in the furniture can expand the imagination for what could be. For some clients, this is going to help sell them on the space. 
And to make this faster for yourself, you can create architectural blocks of various furniture arrangements and save them in the library to place in future homes. So, for instance, in this plan, if I wanted to make this living room an architectural block, I can hold down my control key and select every item together, then down in the edit toolbar, I'll make them an architectural block. Then once I've blocked it together, I can select add to library, and it will put them in my user catalog as a blocked item. This will now be available for me to use in future plans, so I don't have to spend time searching for the individual items. Finally, in previous videos, I showed quite a few settings that we can go in to optimize our renderings. I mentioned that I have some settings that I start with, for the sun, for instance, or within the rendering techniques themselves. The more you work with renderings, the more you will have common numbers that you'll start with, and you can set these in your defaults rather than needing to set it for each individual camera. There still may be things that you need to adjust for each camera, but this will help you get a part of the way there. So let's take a look at some of the defaults you might want to set in your plan. I'm going to open a blank plan, and then we'll go to Edit, Default Settings. First, we'll look at our rendering techniques and select to edit them. Under the physically based rendering, ray trace, we can set some starting values. I'll drop down the daytime backdrop intensity to 500, and then up the brightness to 100%. Then I'll select OK. Now, anytime I switch to the physically based rendering technique in this plan, it will utilize these settings. The next default I want to take a look at is the CPU ray trace. This will allow me to create new configurations for this plan or to edit the lighting for the existing ones, including setting some starting values for the image properties. Next, let's look at our sunlight defaults. Now for this, we'll want to be thinking about whether we want to set this default for CPU or GPU ray tracing. I use GPU ray trace more often, so I'm going to set it with that in mind. So I'll switch over to the generic sun, and I'm going to lower it to 5000. Then I adjust it for the cameras I'd like to use for CPU ray trace on an individual basis. So for those, I'll bring the sunlight back up to 100,000 in the plan. So next, let's look at the camera tools themselves. I want to edit multiple of these at once, so I'm going to hold down my control key to select the first four, which are all of my perspective camera views. Then I'll select edit to open them all together. For all of these views, I'd like to have shadows, reflections, and bloom turned on. You may or may not want bloom for yours. And if you want to, you can switch over to automatically use the default light set. But beware, this will have every light in your plan turned on. So if you're gonna do large homes with a lot of light, I do not recommend this. In that case, you'd wanna create light sets at the beginning of your plan and then set it for each individual camera. We also can add a backdrop if you'd like the backdrop to match for all of these camera types. Then I'll select OK. As mentioned, there still may be a couple of things you'll need to set per camera, and you'll need to make adjustments based on the scene, as we mentioned earlier. One of the settings you'll need to look at each time, as we just talked about, is the light set being used. But what I do to keep myself from having to repeat work is to place one camera in one room, like, say, this living room, change several of the settings here, and then once I'm done with that, I'm going to go ahead and copy the camera around the room. I'll select the camera, down in the edit toolbar I'll select the copy paste, and then I'm going to just drag the copy of the camera over to another area of the room. Then I'll need to open it to make sure the angle is correct, but this will save me quite a bit of time versus creating each camera individually. And again, if I would like to change the light set, I can do so. Also, if the first camera was already saved in the plan, when I copy it, the copy will be as well. So that finishes up our series on ray trace rendering. We've gone through the types of ray tracing available in Chief Architect, 
the material properties, the lighting, and then in this video we've gone through some general tips. So hopefully all of this will help you to create some great renderings for your clients.